Before I get into the message on uh, Lord, teach us to pray, um, there are a couple things I want to share with you as well. Um, but I want you to know we, we are trying to do the best job we possibly can in this area of communication, and it's always a challenge to communicate everything we desire. But we try to make the utmost of these priority communications that we bring to you and bring you the most significant things. Um, and so I just thank David and our team for trying to always do that. But one, a couple of things I want to mention to you. One is in the area of uh, the coronavirus. Our world is talking about it. As a matter of fact, if you watch the news very long about it, you will get very stressed. I mean, I don't know if you experience that, but I do when I see it on the news. Here's a couple of things I want to share with you about it. Um, one, rather than panicking, we need to pray. You know, we need to pray for our own hearts, pray for our neighborhoods, pray for protection. And you need to pray that God will stop it. I mean, I think that's a very realistic prayer. It just, it needs to be finished. And so uh, we need to ask that God would do that. And, but I also want you to know that um, I'm meeting with our church leadership team tomorrow night. And we're trying to think about what plan should we have as a church. Uh, how can we... Uh, impact our community and, and reach out and minister in the middle of that. Uh, how can we help our church family, you know, to stay protected and that kind of thing. So anyway, when we're going to meet and talk about that tomorrow night, so would you pray for us in that, that we'd have wisdom to know how to walk through this time. And I'm thinking about as I as I'm chairing the Cochrane Ministerial to talk with some of my uh, fellow leaders in the community if there's a way that even the ministerial ought to respond. So anyway, just pray for us in that. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to let you know about is, of course, we know that... Uh, uh, Daniel, we're going to get to commission him as a teacher at Miller. That'll be exciting uh, and sad for us all at the same time. Uh, but I want you to know that your, your, search, your personnel team has done an amazing job putting together a strategy for the church in this time. And I'll be presenting that. They'll be presenting that actually to the leadership team tomorrow night. And so if the leadership team affirms the strategy that the personnel team has put together, then we'll be walking into our next steps of looking for our next youth minister youth pastor so anyway it's kind of exciting time for us i wanted to give you the the closest update about that and so appreciate your prayers uh for that a lot because we want to know god's next leader for our youth ministry and uh it's kind of hard and awkward to say in light of daniel and kayla being here but they want the best for our church too and so we're trusting god for that and that's the latest update on that just wanted you to know all right I'm excited to walk into this message series with you. I know that Daniel did an amazing job last Sunday introducing the idea of asking Jesus to teach us to pray. One of the things I want you to know is that I'm using some material from this book, and I would highly recommend it to you. It's so good. You see the title is How to Pray and a Simple Guide for Normal People. I think that's good teachings and practices in here that I just want you to know that I'm using some outlines and some things and thoughts from there. And so I just uh, didn't want anyone to say, you're plagiarizing. Well, I'm not really. I've told you about it now, right? <laughs> anyway, so, but this outline is given in the book using the acrostic pray, and it's really good. We're going to follow it as we walk through Luke chapter 11, beginning with verse 1 in a moment. But today we're going to talk about this idea of pausing, pausing before we pray, um, if you're teaching this outline, by the way, to others or even kids or whatever, you might want to use the word yes instead of yield. It kind of might help be helpful in that as well. But let's now begin looking at Luke chapter 11, verse 1, as we unpack this idea of saying, Lord, teach us to pray. The one thing that we have in the word where Jesus' disciples asked him specifically to teach them was about prayer. They said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? I, I don't know what your personal experience with prayer has been, but I think that all of us would agree that our experience with prayer is not everything that it can be. No matter if you are a dynamic prayer Jedi <laughs> or if you are learning about prayer, wherever you may be in this idea of prayer, the Lord can still teach you to pray. And he can teach me to pray. And Jesus prayed in such a way 
that it got the attention of his disciples. That's your first note for your notes this morning. You may want to write that word in there, attention. He prayed in such a way that it got his disciples' attention. And notice from Luke 11, 1, we see this. Another time Jesus was praying, and when he finished, one of his disciples approached him. And he approached him because of how he prayed. And that really challenged me as I thought about this idea of, you know, if someone were to overhear me praying, would they approach me afterwards and say, would you teach me how to pray? I mean, that's what happened with Jesus and his disciples. I'm thinking about you and your own prayer life. Would someone come to you and say, would you teach me to pray? I just heard you pray. I want to learn how to pray as you pray. Well, here's the great news. We're going to learn from the one that had this experience in prayer that others said, teach me. We're going to learn from him. And I think that if you will apply what we learn here, you can also set forth a model in prayer that people can follow. And it's going to be so helpful for each one of us. Do you know that if you desire to pray, if you leave this message saying, I want to grow in my prayer life, you need to know something. God is giving you that desire. It's not a desire you're just stirring up inside of yourself. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament says God has placed eternity in our minds. God has also, God has also placed in our minds a sense of eternity. There's this sense of inside of each one of us that longs for something eternal. God has placed that in there. Let me give you an illustration. There was a lady by the name of Kathy. She was a militant atheist at her university. And one night in her home, when she was gazing down at her sleeping baby there, she was overwhelmed this, with this desire to give thanks to something. She knew there was something more, and this gratitude was coming out of her. And in that silence, she said, thank you. In that moment, when she said that calmly, there was this wave of love that kind of hit her like she'd never experienced before. All of a sudden, she realized that she had been so militantly going against this God. And all of a sudden, God was beginning to reveal himself to her in all of his kindness and his graciousness. There was something eternal that was crying out inside of her. And she became a follower of Christ and has been following Jesus now for 30 years. There is desire inside of people that God has inherently, inherently put inside of us to know and to long and to cry out for the eternal. And fortunately, the Lord Jesus has given us a model. He's given us a plan. He's given us an outline, a roadmap that we can follow. Can you imagine that we get to learn from the Lord Jesus himself? We get to follow his plan and his strategy, and it's so good. And he was such an amazing person of prayer. Look at this. Early in the morning, Jesus got up. He left the house while it was still dark outside and went to a deserted place to pray. Even before the Lord Jesus launched his ministry, he fasted for more than a month in the wilderness. Before choosing his 12 disciples, he prayed all night. <laughs> when he heard about his cousin's execution, he went to a solitary place to pray. Jesus prayed and he prayed and he prayed. You see, he prioritized prayer. The Bible prioritizes prayer. At most pages in the Bible cry out in some type or form of prayer. The priority for prayer is found throughout the Bible. It's found in the life of Christ. And we can have this priority in, in our lives. This priority is so significant. You know why? Because the Lord Jesus wants us to know him and to walk with him. Look at this passage of scripture. He said, my sheep respond as they hear my voice. I know them intimately and they follow me. The great news for you will be in this. If you dive into this and say, Lord, teach me to pray. What you will begin to find is your intimacy with Jesus growing. And I think that we long for that. I long for this. And you must know I'm not teaching on this because I've got it all figured out. I need to be in the school of prayer. We all do. We all need this. 
So what we're saying in this series is, Lord Jesus, teach me to pray. So let's look at Luke 11, 1 here from the voice translation. God does know our thoughts. That's amazing. But when you and I actually communicate it, when we say it out, it's like it's a commitment on our part. We're like taking part and we're realizing it's a very real relationship. So it's so much more than God just knowing our thoughts. It is us connecting with the God of heaven. That's a big part of what we're talking about today. Now, before we jump into Jesus' example prayer, he has some advice for us. And it is really solid advice. I think you'll appreciate it. So when, when you go to prayer, when we say, Lord Jesus, will you teach us to pray? Will you, will you teach us, like John taught his disciples, would you do the same with us? Will you disciple us? Will you teach us to pray? Please teach us to pray. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to give us a real simple strategy. Look at how he was teaching about prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 to 8. Jesus said, and when you pray, don't go on and on excessively and strangely like the outsiders. They think their verbosity will let them be heard by their deities. Do not be like them. Your prayers need not be labored or lengthy or grandiose, for your Father knows what you need before you ever ask him. I mean, aren't you glad for that? That you don't have to get out some dictionary and figure out the right words to pray? That God wants our prayers to be simple. He wants them to be honest. He wants them to be so, so true. They don't have to be grandiose and flowery and have all the right words. <laughs> Jesus actually gave us a great illustration and a story that's actually quite surprising. And so I want to take you there and take a look at what he was saying. Jesus told another parable. This one addressed to people who were confident in their self-righteousness and looked down on other people with disgust. Jesus said, imagine two men walking up a road. Can you see the picture? Going to the temple to pray. One of them's a Pharisee. The other is a despised tax collector. And once inside the temple, the Pharisee stands up and prays this prayer and honors her over here. Just look at me. I fast not once but twice a week, and I faithfully pay my taxes on every penny of income. Now, that was one person, and Jesus points out the second one. He says, over in the corner, the tax collector begins to pray, but he won't even lift his eyes to heaven. He pounds his chest in sorrow and says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus goes on to say, now imagine these two men walking back down the road to their homes. Listen, Jesus said, it's the tax collector who walks home clean before God and not the Pharisee, because whoever lifts himself up will be put down and whoever takes a humble place will be lifted up. I mean, I'm really glad for that. I'm thankful that it's the humble place the place when I come before God and I really do realize my need of him and that I just need to be who I am. He loves me. He loves me for the words that Gary has to say. He loves me for where I am and he wants me to be very real and honest with him. Thomas Merton put it this way when he said, God is far too real to be met anywhere else than in reality. <laughs> Your reality of where you're at, what you're facing. We need to be real in prayer, honest, how you really feel. You see, God knows your motivations. He understands your pleas. We see all kinds of prayers throughout the Bible. I want to just show you briefly, just for the honesty of what we're talking about here, I want to show you a whining prayer from the Bible. It almost sounds like a toddler, but it's actually a grown man that's praying this prayer. He literally is whining, but God understands his motivation. But look at what we find in Numbers 11 with Moses to the Lord. He says, why are you so hard on me? I'm your devoted servant. Why don't you look on me with affection? Why do I have the great burden of these spiteful people? Did I conceive them, bear them, give them birth? Why should you tell me to carry them as a nanny does some suckling infant? into the land that you swore to their ancestors. 
That sounds like whining, doesn't it? I'm thinking, God, I am so glad that you want us just to talk with you about how things really are, how we're seeing them. I mean, God made adjustments in Moses. He will help us too. But he wants us to be so real, so, so real. So I talk to you about reality and honesty and talking with God about what's going on in your life, how it is. One other thing I need to talk to you about before, again, we look at Luke 11 again, is that you and I not only need to be real and honest, but we must make time to pray. We must make time to pray. And it, it's really something you might be saying, well, I know that, but I want to talk to you about this point for just a minute. Jesus actually said... The example, he, in, in prayer, he, in the early in the morning, Jesus got up, left the house while it was still dark outside, and went to a deserted place to pray. Now, I'm not saying you have to pray in the morning. Actually, you know what your best time to pray is? Is when you have time to pray. So if you're a nighttime person, pray at night. If you're the most effective then, find a time, make a commitment, and start to pray. Start to pray. Um, now, with those kind of things being said, and, and it's like I've given you a second introduction. Daniel did an amazing job in his introduction to prayer last Sunday. I want to begin teaching you now a rhythm for your prayer life. And we're going to start with that first letter from the acrostic pray, P. It stands for pause. And I want to give you a core scripture that actually you should make sure and take down at the bottom of your note page. This scripture is there, so it's, it's not written out, but it's there so you know how to find it. But here it is, this core scripture for this. Be still, be calm, see and understand I am the true God. That's Psalm 4610 from the voice translation. This first word, pause. We don't just pause because we're like just trying to do something nice or clear our heads. No, the idea of pausing is to stop and consider this. I am addressing the true God. <laughs> In our world of cell phones and all kinds of communication and things going on, hitting us thousands of things every day, it's hard to stop and pause. <laughs> That's why this is first. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like pausing. I don't like stoplights. I don't like stopping. I don't like it when I get behind the train, which seems to happen almost every day since I live here in Cochrane. Amen. I don't know how they time that around my schedule, but it's always timed around my schedule to meet the train. But God knows that I need to pause, need to stop. And in our world of all this information coming at us, we need to stop and pause and contemplate and realize that even, even in a prayer before mealtime, we need to stop and pause and just say, okay, it's not like I'm talking to my neighbor here. I'm talking to the God of heaven. So the first instruction in prayer is pausing. <laughs> you might be saying, well, isn't prayer about speaking? Well, it is, but prayer is also about us getting our heads and our hearts in the right spot. <laughs> Stopping and pausing, being still. This is for your notes here, for you to put these words in on the lines there. Do you advance? There we go. Look at that. So put in there, be still, be calm, see and understand. I am the true God. Psalm 46, 10. What I'm going to invite you to do is put that verse somewhere where you're going to remember it. Why do we need to do this? Well, let me, let me illustrate uh, from my past history. Have any of you had a traveling job, at least sometime in the past, where you had to travel some, you come home to the kids or whatever? Yeah, some of you have tra traveling jobs, yeah. So when I worked for the North American Mission Board, I was actually traveling a lot, and I traveled a lot when I had young kids. If you have a traveling job, you might recall something that happens if you have little ones. Uh, when you come home for a trip, there is a question that comes. It's not, Daddy, I love you so much. It's, did you bring me anything? <laughs> I have some kids here. I don't know, do you remember asking me that question? Did you bring me something, right? So it's okay that you guys asked me that. That's okay. Uh, but what I wanted more than anything else is for them to run up and wrap their arm around me. Say, I missed you. I love you. It's good to have you home. Now, I'm sure they did that too, right? But you might understand where I'm going with this. 
is this pausing. It helps us to stop and get our heads in the right place rather than just going before God because we can have such a want and a wish list to take to God. But really, we need to stop and pause because Jesus instructed us something here that we're going to look at that is so utterly simple and yet so utterly profound. Can you imagine with me? This is what Jesus, this is how he told us to begin. What did he say? Because we have so much going on in our world, in our heads, in our hearts, so much busyness, we must stop and pause and think, I am calling the God in heaven, Father. This is why you need this. This is why I need this. This is why we need this first instruction that is so simple and yet so utterly profound to stop and help us to pause it reminded me of, of a very funny thing that happens in a Christmas movie that we tend to watch um, many Christmases. I think it's, it's called Jingle All the Way. Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's in his office d talking to all of his people, all the people he has sales with. And if you can remember what happens is he's tell, told like 50 people in a row, you're my favorite customer, you're my favorite customer. And then his wife calls, and he finishes the call. You're my favorite customer. Do you know what happens in prayer? It's almost the same thing. As we get so used to it, or it becomes so normal, or we just are always used to thanking God at mealtime, or whatever the case is, and it's almost like we forget how radical it is. And this is exactly why I keep taking you back to this psalm here. Be still, be calm, see, and understand. I am the true God. We must learn to pause. We must learn to pause. Eugene Peterson said it well. He said, life's basic decision is rarely, if ever, whether to believe in God or not, but whether to worship or compete with him. And so this idea of pausing, this idea of this Psalm 46, why I keep bringing that in front of you all the time, is I'm saying there are so many things that are competing. There are so many things that are going on, even our own selves. We have to stop and pause and get ourselves in the right, right place. There's something very precious in the book of Psalms that we see over and over again. And the majority of us have never stopped to pause and think about what it means. It's this word that we find 71 times in the Psalms. It's the word sila. It's there. And it seems like it is there because it's an instruction to pause and an invitation to weigh the meaning of the words that we are reading and praying. Sila. Stop. Pause. Ponder. Way out what you are reading, what you are thinking about it. It really helps us to get ready to have our best time of prayer. <laughs> so I'm giving you this as an assignment. I'm actually going to give you a few prayer assignments every week because I'm hoping that you're going to leave practicing what we're talking about. So really, the first, this is the prayer assignment, pausing. Before you go right into prayer, dear God, I think I need this for the day. Would you help me? And then, you know, just, no, no, stop and pause. Give yourself a little extra time. Because what happens is we can enter our day with such stress already, and it's already moving. And you know what happens when you're stressed? Your adrenal glands release this hormone called cortisol, and it impairs your capacity for clear thinking and healthy decision making. So sitting quietly and pausing it's kind of like, can you picture the glass, a glass of water that's clear with sediment in it, and then you see it settling down. We're just settling down our hearts and getting us ready to be in the right place so we can pray aright. So where would you do that? Let me get so practical with you about this message today. Where would you find that be still spot? 
I mean, I have my spot and my, my chair in my front room. It's where I like to go and have my time with God. This is going to be my be still spot where I'm going to be practicing pausing. Again, this is not my favorite thing to do. I like to go after stuff and get it done. But I'm going to practice pausing. Where would yours be? And when are you going to do that? Earlier in my message, I said when. The best time for you to pray is when you can find time to pray. So when are you going to pray? And now I'm asking you where. So when and where? Where are you going to find your be still spot? Now, for some folks, I don't know about you, some of you, if you sit down for too long, you're finding you're having a great rest and nap with God, right? So some of you need a prayer walk. If you're on a street, keep your eyes open. It's okay. You need a prayer walk. But find that time, find that spot. Here's something else very practical I want to, I want to do with you. I am giving you my pastor email here. I want to invite you to write me. Pastor at bowvalleybaptist.com. I want to send you a video. It is a video about this concept, this idea. I'm actually going to have one every week for the next few weeks. I'd like you to write me and ask for it. Now, you can't write me this week and say, hey, send me the next three. No, you've actually got to write me every week, okay? But I want you to write me and ask me for a video, and it is so good in continuing to help emphasize this thought of what we're talking about. And I think it will be so, so helpful for you. I also would invite you to begin looking at Luke chapter 11, verses 2 to 4, and we're going to start talking about the letter R out of pray next week. All right, so here's the assignments. You're like, now what were those? Did you say? Okay, first one is, um, I've invited you to find a spot to pray. I've invited you to write me and ask for the video. And then I want you to watch the video. <laughs> Don't just ask me for it. Watch the video. It's about 20 minutes, right, Linda? It's about 20 minutes, right? So you need to set aside that amount of time to watch that video. And it's so, so good. And so I've invited you to make a commitment to pray, find a place to pray. I've invited you to write me and ask for this video. I've invited you to write that Psalm 46, verse 10. And that, if you like that translation, it's called the voice translation. It reads a lot more like a manuscript of a, per, of a play, that translation. It's kind of how it's written. And so you might enjoy that. So look that up. Keep that verse in front of you and learn to pause. I'm actually going to give you a great verse here as I wrap things up, and then I'm going to pray with you. Um, this is a great pausing kind of verse, helping us to see the outcome of what happens when we get into this place. Let's look at Psalm chapter 131, verses 1 and then 2. O eternal one, my heart is not occupied with proud thoughts. My eyes do not look down on others. I don't even begin to get involved in matters too big, matters of faith, state, and business, or the things that defy my ability to understand them. Of one thing I am certain. Oh, of one thing I am certain. My soul has become calm, quiet, and contented in you. Like a weaned child resting upon his mother, I am quiet. My soul is like this weaned child. God really desires to do something fresh and new in your life as you learn to pray, relearn to pray, begin taking your prayer life to a different level. God wants to do something special in you. And teach you to walk with him. Teach you to rest in him. Teach you to pause and contemplate. And I'm communicating here with the God of heaven. And the God of heaven wants to know me. He wants to walk with me. He wants me to share my heart with him, my mind with him, my whininess with him, my reality with him, my realness with him. You don't have to be grandiose in your words. You connect with him just as you are. Aren't you grateful for that? I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> well, let's pray together. God, I thank you that you are going to teach us how to pause. <laughs> I thank you that you will teach us, God, how to learn to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you set such a great model for us and that you're going to guide us through this. You're going to be our great teacher. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. You're the best teacher. So thank you for teaching us in this. Thank you that you are the great model. And God, I thank you that you have created us 
to know you. You've created us to walk with you. And you love to teach us. And so, God, I believe that you will do this. You will take our whole congregation to a new place of prayer. You will build our relationship. You will teach us more how to trust you. You will teach us how to communicate the reality of our hearts and that we'll find more and more words flowing out to you as our loving Heavenly Father. And so, God, thanks for that. Thanks for teaching me, Jesus, how to pray. I must learn. I want to be in school. And so, God, thank you for that. How awesome it is, God, to know you and walk with you. And, God, I pray that you'll teach us how to pray in such a way that others will hear our prayers and they'll long to pray. They'll long to know you, God, because they hear how we relate to you. And so, God, thanks for that, too. Thanks, God, for your word, how real it is, how powerful it is, how alive it is, and how it will shape us as we leave this place and go into our week. Thank you, God, now for this beautiful song that we're going to sing and the realities and the truths within it. And how in it, God, we hear you crying out to us for us to know you and walk with you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.